So first up, a confession, I am not a gamer, but all of my siblings are, and so were lots of my friends growing up. And so as I associated with gamers, I became aware of this social discourse that stigmatizes them as lazy and violent and incapable of participating properly in the real world. So for this project, I interviewed my youngest brother, who goes by Cairo XVX, on his Xbox Live account. And I asked him to help me understand how he navigated these intersections between his real and his game lives. So in exploring gamer mentality, I hope to subvert the opinion that gaming is unimportant, unproductive, constructs lazy people, and creates ideologies of some distorted and violent reality. In the popular media and in a lot of sociological work, gamers are continually exoticized as some strange and subversive other. The media warns against gaming and attempts to get kids off the computer outside, plus they become unproductive and violent members of our society. And I'm not going to participate in this discourse. By letting my brother's life history of gaming speak for itself, I hope to facilitate an understanding of the way that gamers understand these stereotypes of laziness and violence. And I hope that um, I have to take a close look at the emotional and logical decisions of my brother as a gamer, and that this will make gamers perhaps seem more ordinary than they currently appear, and fight against those um, myths and stereotypes that they constantly have to deal with. So Cairo says, all my friends are just like me. All gamers have the same story, really. It's interesting, but it's absolutely true. Why pick gaming as a hobby? In junior high, Cairo was frequently bullied at school. Although he's healthy and fit, um, he's always suffered from severe asthma and bad eczema, which makes participation in gym class and general social life very difficult for him. So as an answer to these circumstances, Cairo attended an online high school, which linked him with other students who did not function well in public schools. Critically, he also began gaming in junior high as a means of escape, and eventually as a means of making friends, finding meaning, and developing talents and skills through his gaming. Cairo centers his entry into this virtual world as an escape from reality, particularly bullying. Um, in Cairo's case, black eyes, bruises, and other forms of bullying were very real. And in order to escape from this real life trauma, um, Cairo turned to a digital world. Ironically, the very place that Cairo used to escape from the violence he was experiencing daily um, was a space that has been frequently branded as overtly violent and traumatic by our society. With this in mind, some might think that a physical outcast would therefore take a digital body and use it to take out the anger um, directed at people that they could not get even with in real life. Cairo's discourse about his newfound freedom, though, was somewhat different. He says, back when I got beat up in junior high and I was terrified of school and stuff, you know, I had pirates, I had a giant war frigate, and I could go float around in the ocean and be by myself. To be by myself. Cairo didn't think about getting even with bullies via gaming or working on his anger in a violent space. He wanted to escape somewhere where he could feel an individual worth and an independence that he couldn't get at school. He wanted to be left alone. He saw real life as a traumatic space, one to be avoided at all costs. And so he moved to game life, where trauma was replaced with safety, independence, and adventure. Um, Cairo has played many different games over um, the years to escape from reality, and his current game of choice is Halo. He says, go to Forge World if you need a place to go. If you're a gamer, you go to Forge World in Halo Reach, and you've got a lot of space, and it's just you, and you alone, and it's a beautiful world. It would be so cool to just walk out on a Halo ring and be like, there's nobody here. Perfect air and everything. Massive empty forerunner structures that you can walk around. Um, Cairo recently produced a four minute video of Forge World to show off the sweeping landscapes, the freedom, power, and solitude that he experiences when he plays in Forge World. Um, for someone whose asthma and eczema has kept him from being outside as much as he would like, the ability to virtually experience the outdoors is very empowering to him. 
Um, so gaming is how Cairo chose to escape from the real world and into a place where he feels empowered and safe. But junior high was years ago, and Cairo is still gaming. Why I keep doing it? I think it's because a lot of gamer gamers are alone people. They're always the people that would get bullied at school. You hear this all the time from gamers. They're the ones that had no social life. So they turn to a digital world, and it's a whole new world for them. They have created worlds that we'll never see in our lifetime, but someone else has created for us to go and explore. That's a huge reason why I play Halo Reach so much, because you have that huge forge map, forge world. You could go anywhere, fly a falcon or a banshee, and just fly anywhere. Build huge maps. You could create your own custom game types and continually have new things to do, and you wouldn't get bored with the game. It's an escape. So this is the picture one of my friends was here, gave me, um, which makes me laugh. So a bunch of gamers did a fundraiser through gaming, and they got all this food to um, give to the shelter, and the news media didn't think it was worth it, talking about, which makes me kind of sad. Um, so Cairo's story does not stand as an isolated life history. It speaks back to the discourse surrounding gamers as by the end Individuals. Um, Cairo understood these concepts, these stereotypes, when he told me he talked to me about his gaming. He was aware of the popular media representations of gamers, of the stereotype he has as a gamer, and the reputation he holds as a gamer. So during the process of reading literature about gamers and online identity, I was struck by the fact that gamers are always treated as an exotic other, a slightly subversive subculture whose existence has to be justifiable. Um, the popular media, which is likely the source of most information for concerned parents, um, publicizes gaming as at best an alternative hobby, and at worst, a violent and corrupting medium. It's a discourse that I've also heard from parents, grandparents, and teachers over the years. Interestingly, the academic literature is much better. In the socio um, in the literature that I reviewed, the trend was to look at how players manage the violence that they encountered in the gaming world and how they justified their perpetual, perpetual participation in it. So the popular media um, frowns upon extensive amounts of time spent gaming, which is thought to produce unproductive, lazy, and violent individuals. Cairo is no stranger to this discourse and he deals with it on a daily basis. And without any prompting during our discussion, he volunteered a defense of violence and gamers. He says, people think gaming destroys people. And it does, if you have a bad mental state of mind about it. You hear after all the shootings at schools and stuff, people blame the video game community. But you know, I don't think there's no reason to blame the gaming community. The community is full of friendly people. Of course there's online jerks. But I don't think a lot of people, like 99% of people, wouldn't go and shoot up a school after playing Grand Theft Auto, which is probably one of the worst games to play. You can get into a car at Grand Theft Auto and steal someone's car without getting in trouble. In real life, you can't do that. You're screwed. People really think that gaming has that impact on people, but it doesn't. Because you could drive into a military base on Grand Theft Auto and fly away in one of their jets and magically know how to fly their jet and fly away and be okay. You can't do that in real life. You're going to be shot. So a few things are interesting here. First, that Cairo volunteered this opinion. Second, that he recognizes the need to perform this narrative to those who may disapprove of his gaming. It shows us that as a gamer, Cairo is used to needing to justify his gaming to other people, his parents, his teachers, his friends, society in general. Um, gaming is not considered a pastime conducive to efficient, to motivate, and productive people. So understanding this and juggling his gaming with his schoolwork, a job, and his family are all a fundamental part of Kyra's day-to-day -day thought process. And this picture just makes me laugh. He says, I see that they, his parents, do want me to do something different with my life, but I also see that it makes me happy. And you know, I have depression. I have anxiety about things. This is where I get rid of it. It's what makes me happy. It's something that I like doing, and that's all that really matters, right? Cairo is participating here in something that Carr calls flipping the script, which turns the tables on a discourse of productivity, 
by asserting that being happy is what really matters. This phrase, no doubt learned from his parents, is an attempt to flout society's conception of what a productive individual is by placing productivity in terms of happiness and not in terms of education or capitalism. Um, so here are some pictures from the Halo 4 midnight release in Seattle. And why can't happiness be productive? People are very clearly happy. <laughs> and the master chief is adorable. So by understanding that many people, including his parents, feel that gaming is not productive, he acknowledges that gaming is considered by many to be an illegitimate use of his time. So while Cairo does not apologize for his gaming habits, he is aware that many people probably feel that he should. In order to be productive, he should use a different scale to balance his gaming and school work and real life interactions. However, Cairo hangs on to his ideals of gaming making him happy and benefiting him personally as productivity enough. He says, I can go home and I'm happy. I have my TV. I have my Xbox. The third and final point of interest in his defense tells us that Cairo, as a gamer, is perfectly aware of the difference between real and game life, and that performing gaming actions in real life is not only inappropriate, but ridiculous. Gamers know how to operate in real life even if they have been socially shunned from it. He also recognizes the fact that gaming can be dangerous just as anything overindulged in can be, and he faces that fact. He sees that those who frame gaming as inherently violent and creating violent people also need to be acknowledged, and that gamers must each determine how much gaming is a healthy amount for them. So in conclusion, Cairo's life history illustrates the way that he, as a gamer, navigates the intersection between his real and game lives. And by allowing him to speak for himself, his history speaks back to the predominant social discourse that stigmatizes gamers as exotic and subversive others. Um, for Cairo, gaming is important, productive, and acts as a separate world from the real world. This is particularly evident when he confronts the discourse of violence in gaming. He entered into the gaming world to escape the violence of the real one, and he continues to participate in gaming as he makes more friends there of all ages who have experienced similar past traumatic violence I understand that one gamer's story can in no way stand as representation of all gamers, but it does offer a valid, emotional, and honest intervention into the way that society perceives of gamers. Thank you.